Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, before we do get started, I do want to remind you this program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. And I particularly want to thank Carrie, Hunter, and Deborah so much for their support. Uh, we'll send along access to the uh, premium site as we do with all donations of uh, $7 or more. And also for donations received during listener support campaign, uh, we'll send along uh, a free ebook and an additional thank you gift. Among the thank you gifts we do have available at the $50 level, uh, I'll be happy to send along one of my uh, novels or all I needed to know I learned from Columbo as an audiobook. So Tales of the Dim Knot, Flower, Fly Another Day, and Powerhouse Hard Press, all available as audiobooks at the $50 level. And at the $100 level, I'll be happy to send along any Agatha Christie uh, audiobook that is available through audible.com. A full list of available thank you gifts are available at support.greatdetectives.net. Uh, you can also mail in a donation to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And if you would like to receive extras and premiums, please include a email address and also a physical address if you'd like DVDs, books, etc., all right, well, now it's time for Crime and Peter Chambers. The original air date, August the 17th of 1954. The title, The School Teacher and the Professor. Crime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring as Peter Chambers, Dane Clark. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. You find yourself in a university, but you're not a student. Generally, you're allergic to classrooms, but the lady talking to you, the teacher by name Elaine Janis, well, she's uh, sort of an antidote for the classroom allergy. I need your help, Mr. Chambers. I need your help desperately. She has large brown eyes and a smooth white forehead. And despite her obvious agitation, she's a sweet young thing, this Elaine Janis. Starchy, but sweet. I need your help, Mr. Chambers. Not for myself, for another. Uh, help? That's uh, my racket. Help, a public helper. Although sometimes I'm known as Peter Chambers, a private eye. Oh, well, there will be a fee, of course, Don't worry Mr. about Chambers. the fee. I'm like a doctor. It depends on what the traffic will bear. And sooner or later, you'll get your bill. It's, it's about Professor Stanley Sanders. Sanders? Hey, papers have been full of it. Your steer, Professor Stanley Sanders, suspected of killing his wife and uh, suspected as putting him mildly. Oh, not Stanley. Uh, not Professor Sanders. He, he could no more harm any human being than... Oh, than right, right, not right, Stanley. He's the sweetest, kindest person in the whole world. Well, what do you want me to do, Miss Janice? I want you to try to find out who did kill Mrs. Sanders. Well, does the uh, good professor know that you're retaining me? Oh, no, no, he doesn't. And I don't want him to know. I'll have to talk to him. Well, tell him. Tell him that you've been retained, but that your client doesn't wish the name divulged. Uh -huh. Just uh, one more little question. Yes? What's your interest in this? Mine? Yes, yours. Well, I have known Professor Sanders for a long time. I think by his silence and his non-cooperation with the police, I, I think he's been wrongfully suspected. He's a fine person, a good man, a kind man. Professor Stanley Sanders lives in a suburb at the edge of the Bronx. 
You drive up there and you find a modest, neat little house. Yes. Yes, Mr. Chambers. The professor's a young man, sandy-haired and straight-eyed. Yes. What is it, please, Mr. Chambers? Well, I'm not here as a student, Professor Sanders. No. What are you here as? An investigator. Investigator? Are you from the police? No, no, no. I'm a private investigator. I've been retained to, uh, look into the, well, the death of your wife. I'm sorry, Mr. Chambers. I don't know who retained you, and I don't care. But I've I... told the police what I know, and that's that. There's nothing further I can add. Professor... Now, if you please, I'm a very busy man. And that's how you read about it in the newspapers. Stubborn Professor Stanley Sanders, who disclaims any knowledge of the murder of his wife, although he was home at the time. Three children, all of them up in camp. So you go to the fountainhead of information, police headquarters, and your very good friend, Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker. Ah, you're mixed up in a rough one this time, Petey, my lad. Louie, Louie, what happened there? Exactly what happened there? Well, all we got is Professor Stanley Sanders' story. All right, what's the story? Well, it's about a week ago. Uh-huh. It's a warm night. Three kids are off at camp. Uh-huh. Professor is alone with his wife at their home in the Bronx. Now, he's wearing slacks and a sweatshirt. Look, Louie, I'm not interested in the sartorial well, effect. be interested. Well, why must because I be... Because it's got a bearing on the case. All right, all right. All right, okay, okay, all right. Okay. Well, about ten minutes before the murder happens, Professor Sanders is seen strolling outside in the slacks and the sweatshirt. Then he goes into the house. The rest is his story. All right, what is his story? Well, the wife was in the kitchen. He went upstairs to the bedroom to read... So, according to him, he hears sounds of a scuffle. He runs downstairs and he gets hit a hard blow on the neck, knocks him out. When he comes to, his wife is on the kitchen floor, stabbed 15 times. She's dead. Sweatshirt he was wearing, it's gone. Missing. And so? So, that's the story, period. Guy himself, the professor, absolutely refuses to cooperate any further. Well, what's he got to cooperate about? Oh, now listen hard, Mr. Peep, and try and think like a grown-up detective. I'm listening, Master. Look, I'm a harness bull. I don't do the glamour routine like uh, you I guys. I said I was listening, Louis. All right. It's an isolated home on Staten Island. Wife stabbed to death. Nobody home except him and the missus. Kitchen knife missing, sweatshirt missing right off his body. And what are your ideas on that? Well, only that the sweatshirt was bloodstained and he got rid of it together with the knife. We accuse him, he refuses to talk, except to deny the murder. We want him to take a lie detector test, refuses, absolutely. Now, what would you think, Pete? Oh, don't ask me, Louis. I'm a glamour boy. You're the harness bull. It's your thinking that counts. Well, I think the guy's guiltier than seven devils in Hades. Well, why don't you lock him up? Because there's one thing missing. And that? Motive, my boy. Motive for murder. Oh. That we ain't got. So, so far, all we can do is accuse him and holler and papers make a big stink about it. Without motive, we're hamstrung, Pete. Yeah, I suppose you are. What else you got, Louie, that the uh, newspapers haven't got? Oh, now, look, son. Come on, Louie, it's confidential. It's always confidential. I've been retained on this thing. I'm working. Whatever I dig up, I turn into you. So, uh, noblesse oblige, tit for tat. Come on. (laughs) All right. Take a look. Search of the house disclosed these. Where's the note? Typewritten note. Let me see it. Yeah. Let's see. Look out for yourself. You'll be sorry. And it's signed by initials SS. SS. Stanley Sanders. A couple of weeks ago, he was out of town, so it figures that he wrote her this nice, sweet little letter. We found it in her handbag. And what's the rest of this stuff? Menus. Hey. Mm-hmm. Menus from restaurants, nightclubs. Looks like she was one of them collectors, you know, menus. Can I see that? Yeah, help yourself, detective. Thank you, detective. Don't mention it, detective. One of the menus uh, sort of tickles at you. It tickles at you fit to bust. It's from the Casino Rouge, a hotshot nightclub over on the east side. So you take your leave of your beloved harness bull, but you're too early for the Casino Rouge, so you try Professor Sanders again. There's absolutely nothing I can tell you, Mr. Chambers. 
Nothing that I haven't already told the police. Well, what about that note, Professor? That uh, typewritten note that they attribute to you? I didn't write that note. Then why don't you submit to a lie detector test? Because there's no reason to submit to it. I'm not a criminal. I've lived an exemplary life all my life. I have three children whom I adore. I'm not riffraff, scum. Look, look, There's no reason to submit to a lie detector test. I've told the police exactly what occurred, exactly what happened that night. Well, do you have any explanation for the disappearance of your sweatshirt right off your back? No. Well, what about the kitchen knife, which in this case seems to be the murder weapon? I have no explanation for that. But it's not my province to find explanations. That's the business of the police. Well... Prof, do you uh, know a lady by name of Elaine Janice? Yes. Yes, I know her. She teaches at the university. Look, Professor, how did you get along with your wife? Was Mr. There any... Chambers, I consider that an impertinent question and one that will end this interview right now. Good day to you, sir, and please don't trouble to come back. <laughs> So, that evening, you're an early nightclubber. Casino Rouge goes into action late, but you're early. Sebastian Slocum owns a joint, affectionately known as Sibby to the Joes in the know. But you're not interested in Sibby, not now. Now you're interested in a slick chick who goes by the name of Carmen LaRose. She used to be nuts about her boss, and maybe she still is, but... Anyway, you ask around for her. She's a singer at the joint. Have you been looking for me, Hanson? Carmen LaRose. Tall, dark, and electric. Plenty of voltage. Voltage like a third rail. I hear you've been asking around for me, Petey boy. Yeah, I've been asking around. Tell you something, kiddo. I've been asking around for you. Like how? I called your office a couple times when I got the chance. Well, who's been stopping you? Nobody. And what do you mean when you got the chance? Sibby. He's been close to me, so close to me. Yeah, and you hate him for that, huh? Yes, I hate him. I hate him. I call you, but you are not in. Uh, I've been working on a case. What's uh, with you and Sibby? I thought you were nuts about that mug. No more. I hate him. And I am scared, pretty scared stiff. I I don't know if he knows, but I thought... I don't know if he knows. You don't don't know if I know what, my little boy... Well, how are you doing, Sibby, my little boy? I don't like you in my place of business, Snooper. Me, Sibby, my little boy? I don't like no coppers in my place of business. I'm no copper, Sibby. To me, you're a copper. My little boy, Sibby. Sebastian Slocum. Six feet tall, Latin type, lover type. Sleek, slim, and dapper with wild black eyes that look like they need four alarms to put out the blaze. So kindly do me a very small favor. For you, Sibby, anytime. Get out of my place of business. Get out of here. It's still a free country, Sibby. Free country, sure. Place of business, that ain't free. So get going, Snooper. Get out of here. And if I don't, my little boy... Then I help you. Mike, Jack! What do you mean, you... Hey! Get him out! Have uh, you ever been bounced out of a nightclub? Happens to the best of people. Makes you a member of a very select circle. Anyway, you get up and you brush your clothes and you have a small debate with yourself. Do you go back and break up the joint? Or do you keep punching at your business? You have a tough tussle with your alter ego, but business wins out. So, once more, you go where you aren't wanted, to the home of Professor Sanders. But there you learn that he's been picked up, arrested for the murder of his wife. So you hightail it down to headquarters and you're ushered into Parker's office, and there they are. The good lieutenant, the professor, and what do you know? Elaine Janice. Okay, Pete, we got the whole story. We even know that Miss Janice retained you to help our professor here. Well, you said you didn't have enough on him, Louie, until you had a motive. Which is what we got right now. Plenty of motive. Like what? Like love. Love? Mm Mm-hmm. That's motive for murder? It is when you're in love with the wrong party. I had to tell them, Mr. Chambers. I had to talk. I couldn't hold it any longer. Holding it back was... Well, it was like lying. Yeah, but you... And they should know everything. They should know the truth. Truth? What truth? Dear Professor Sanders and dear teacher here are very much in love. Professor asked his wife for divorce. His wife refused. 
Good enough, detective? Do we have a motive? You see, he didn't do it. I'm perfectly confident. And I want you to know everything, but but he didn't kill her. You want to talk, Professor? I've told you all I intend to tell you. I'll add that I did ask my wife for a divorce and that she refused. But I didn't kill her. As to that, I've given you all the facts. Now, are you in love with Miss Janice here? I am, and I would like to marry her. But I'm not a murderer. I have three children. And it's my intention to try to save them from any possible scandal. Is that why you wouldn't talk? I didn't kill her. That's all I have to say, except I should like to call my lawyer. You don't need a lawyer to answer the simple question. So it goes deep into the night. They put the grill on Professor Sanders, but he clams tighter than a teenager's evening gown. And finally, when Parker throws his hands up in disgust, you get out of there. And where to? Casino Rouge. You owe a debt there. Your dignity's been bruised, among other things. But you're late. Carmen La Rose left with Sebastian Slocum. You throw the bartender a couple of tens and you learn that Carmen lives up at Rye Beach, a little shack up at Rye Beach. It takes you a half hour to get there and then you mosey over to a window and you make with the gander. There they are, drinking it up, the two of them. The window's locked from the inside, but you can hear. Nothing, Sibby, I didn't see nothing. I don't know what you're talking about. You can tell me, honey. I don't care if you saw. But I want to know. I don't want you holding out on Sibby. Uh, Here. No. Here, have a little belt. Have a little belt on Sibby. Ah, oh, you wouldn't hurt me, Sibby. You wouldn't do me no harm, huh? Wouldn't hurt a hair on your head, my little boy. Now, come on. Loosen up. Uh, did you tell me that night? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I was crazy jealous, Sibby, on that phony society dame. You were a toy to her, a plaything, and you were thinking she would divorce a guy for you. Shut up. Okay. Okay. I'm shutting. Don't ask me no more, Sibby. No more. I don't want to talk no more. I didn't see nothing. I don't want to talk no more. Don't you worry, my little boy. You ain't going to talk no more. Never. The guy pulls a knife that looked like it's a foot long. Ah! You go into action. You crash the window. <coughs> and you are in action. He's tough, but he's not tough enough. And when you're finished... <coughs> He's stretched out, cool and comfortable, and nobody's going to hear from Sebastian Slocum until he gets dialed in. But meanwhile, you've got Carmen LaRose on your hands, and I mean on your hands. Hold me, Petey. Kiss me. Carmen. I am afraid. Hold me, please. Now, easy, hold me. easy does it, Carmen, girl. Take hold it me. easy. Kiss me. What's going on here? Kiss me, please. Look, Carmen, my little boy, this isn't the time. It's not the place. It not... is. It is when I am frightened. When, when I am frightened, I am like a little child. Please yeah, but... kiss me. Please, please, please kiss me. Okay, okay. Oh. And now, um... Yes. Talk it up, sister. Oh, yes, I will. Once, once. I love him. I thought I love him. No more, huh? No more. He is like Tomcat. Women, he does not care. Anyway, this one, kid. This one. For once, he is entangled. A society thing. This professor's wife, this uh, Mrs. Sanders. Yeah, 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 yeah. She lead him on. She lead him by the nose. She is one to enjoy. But she does not become entangled. So then, Sibby talks to the wife. And she laughs in his face. She says she is happy, protected as a married woman. So? So, later on, he types a note to her from Casino Rouge office. He thinks I do not see it, but I see it. I see a threatening note. Then she comes then to the club. And again she laughs at him. She laughs right in his face. And then? Then last week he goes there. I go after him. He does not know it, but I am tailing him because I want to know. I want to see the husband is upstairs. I am by the kitchen window. They fight, they argue, and he kills her. Butchers her with kitchen knife. The husband comes down the stairs. 
Sibby, wait behind the door, slugs him. He falls near her. There is blood on his shirt. Then Sibby takes the shirt off him, takes the knife, and he goes. You got any idea why he took the sweatshirt? I imagine to make something that cannot be explained. I imagine to put the suspicion on the husband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To... I imagine that you imagine pretty good, my little one. Ah, so now, please hold me. Please kiss me. Hey. I am afraid. Oh, please. <laughs> And so, once more, you're at police headquarters. Sebastian Slocum is confined to the calaboose. Carmen LaRose is held as a material witness. And Professor Sanders, free as a lark, is in Parker's office with Elaine Janis. And you, you're listening. Professor, I don't get you. I simply don't understand He is a good, dear, fine man. Yeah, but he almost got himself fried in the hot seat, clamming up like he did. Oh, there are all kinds of people, Lieutenant. Yeah, there certainly must be. Scandal, Lieutenant. I shudder at it. I have three children. So you told me over and over and over. Let me give you a little background, Lieutenant. My father was a minister. My mother a devout woman, a social worker. I was brought up very strictly. I am, in essence... An old-fashioned man. So, you know about Slocum? He came to you to ask for your okay for a divorce. Why didn't you tell us? Scandal again, Lieutenant. Bad enough, she was dead. I wasn't going to heap scandal upon scandal. My children, my community, my students. Oh, what a guy. Yes, he's the dearest, finest Yes, but not taking the lie to take the test, holding out on your affection for Miss Janice here, and holding out on that Sebastian Slocum thing, and that, that note, the typewritten note. Weren't you worried, man? Not for a moment, Lieutenant. As I said, I am a devout man. I knew that one way or another, truth would out. (laughs) Yeah, truth would out. Thanks to the crazy operations of this crazy private eye. Thank you, Louis. Well then, Lieutenant, may we go? And peace go with you, Professor. You're quite a guy. Bye, Miss Janice. Bye now, Lieutenant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye now. What a man. <laughs> yes, sir. There's a certain simplicity, a certain integrity. You've got to hand it to him. Yeah, I suppose you have to. All right, now let's get to you. What sent you off to that Casino Rouge? Well, you did, Louis. Me? Yeah, you. Well, like how? How did I send you? Well, maybe I'm a little bit of a rounder, more than you, let's say, but I knew that the Casino Rouge was owned by Sebastian Slocum. So? What's that got to do with it? Well, that note you showed me. Here, let me see it again. I'll show you. Yes, sure. Yeah. See, it's a typewritten note. Mind you, a typewritten note. Mm-hmm. Now it reads, Look out for yourself, you'll be sorry, and it's signed by initials SS. That's right, SS, Stanley Sanders. Professor Stanley Sanders. Also SS for Sebastian Slocum, which it turned out to be. Well, how in the heck did you know that? Psychology, Louis, psychology. First, ask any married man in the world, if he drops his wife a note, would he type it? The answer is no. Plus, and this is even more incontrovertible psychologically... Incontrovertible? Never mind, never mind. What husband in the world would sign a note to his wife by both his initials? Yeah. Yeah, you've got a point there. A husband would sign by his first name, perhaps even by his first initial. But think, no husband is that formal with his wife. Both initials. It just didn't figure psychologically. And that plus the menu from Casino Rouge plus... S.S. owns Casino Room. Yeah, and it sure tickled me, Louie, in the right place. Look, pal, can I say something? Louie, you can say anything. Well, for once, I'd like to go on record with a statement. You know, people make jokes about routine hardest cops like myself and the glamour boys, you guys, private eyes. So I'd like to go on record with a statement. All right, now hit me easy, Louie. I'm not going to hit you at all, Pete. All I want to say for the record, honest bull, private eye... Well done, young man. Very well done indeed. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers Transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Mary Patton as Carmen, 
and Bill Lally as Dr. Shepman. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. with us again next week at this same time for another adventure by Peter Chambers in Crime and Peter Chambers. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Welcome back. Well, even the things that Detective uh, Lieutenant Louis Parker would try to get away with uh, before there were Miranda warnings. Uh, I definitely enjoy just the easy chemistry between uh, Dane Clark and Bill Zuckert. And uh, nice dialogue here. Uh, I do have to say that uh, Crime and Peter Chambers will be coming to an end. In four weeks, we'll be bringing you Man from Homicide, so we only have three more weeks of Crime and Peter Chambers left. So uh, join us for that for the next three weeks, and then coming in four weeks, it will be Man from Homicide. All right, well, on to some listener comments and feedback. Hunter sends in just a simple, encouraging uh Please keep up the great work. Well, thanks so much, Hunter. And then Carrie had a comment uh, regarding the episode uh, Murder at the Racetrack. He writes, I want to go to that racetrack with the odds they gave for that three-horse race. One to five, 40 to one, and 99 to one. They (laughs) They wouldn't be in business long. With three appropriately sized bet, you could guarantee bet you could guarantee yourself a sixteen percent uh, return. Well, um, that is it's unfortunate that that's uh, only a fictional racetrack. Um, the only way I guess it would stay in business if if uh, not everyone was as savvy to pick up on it. Uh, but generally, they they can't take those sort of risk. Um, but good catch there. Also a good catch from Heather, who says uh, when I was listening to this episode I was sure I had heard it somewhere before. My girls and I brainstormed and my 10 year old remembered that I'd seen a similar story on a Martin Kane episode. And uh, she uh, links to a uh, episode of Martin Kane from 1951 starring Lloyd Nolan. And uh, I've seen that episode, too. And it does make sense that Crime and Peter Chambers uh, would borrow from uh, 
uh, Martin Kane since they were both owned by NBC. And so it would be uh, pretty easy to work things out to reuse a, a, a plot idea. And finally, we have a comment from Charles who writes, Congratulations, Adam, on your 1500th episode. It has been a real pleasure to spend many nights driving home late listening to your shows. The darkness and the stillness seem to accentuate the drama and suspense of the sometimes dark and gritty realm of the radio detective, hoping for so many more shows. Well, thanks so much, Charles. Appreciate your uh, congratulation, and uh, thanks so much for your kind comments. All right, well, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for the adventures of Philip Marlowe, and then next week, another episode of Crime and Peter Chambers, and in four weeks, Man from Homicide. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net, Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. And our listener support campaign continues through March the 9th. Uh, you can support the show support.greatdetectives.net. Among the thank you gifts we do have available, at the $50 or $100 level, we'll gladly send you a gift certificate to Radio Archives, good for a purchase of a small or larger uh, old-time radio download in high